Okay, so I started recording. Um, so, <clears throat> so today, um, we're, I think we're looking at the raft bonds DB, which, um, oh, which is, which is, wait, what? Oh, raft. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's a duplicated package, really, but we just wanted to see how it was used in, um, like, how it was used with the Rust protocol, right? And so, yeah, I mean, that was the task, really, for, like, not task, like, what we wanted to, what we set out to, is it to, to understand, right? So, I think maybe I'll just jump right into the code on how I went about it, really. Uh, okay, so I cloned. I, I mean, I, I believe everyone is familiar with Golang. So I cloned it since so it's kind of an old project. So you need to like it doesn't use all these go mods and stuff. So you have to like put it in your what do you call it in your the go path now, right? So um, so like off the bat, how off the bat like I was reading like they said your position provides um, a package that exports bond store, which is an implementation of log store and stable store, right? So I think the first thing was like, what the heck is log store and <laughs> stable store? <laughs> and um, so, yeah, I mean, like on going through, I realized there was only one, one um, store.go file inside the package. Um, inside the package, yeah. So that was where the, there was a bond store, which had a pointer to a bond DB which like is a key value store, right? And you could initialize a bond store. So most of this stuff, like if you've used bond DB or one the call, you're kind of familiar, like um, the shrinking, we talked about the shrinking options, um, all those other stuff. So you could create a new bond store by specifying it. And yeah, so this, this basically creates a bond store at a particular path with the DB. And you could close the bond store um, uh, shrink, which is a bond DB operation. So now this um, first index, last index, get log, store log, store logs, delete range. Um, they are a bunch of functions, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, so they are a bunch of functions that I do really understand how the how they were being used, like. Because the idea was to understand how Raft to work with what to be right. I, I kind of figured it was satisfying some interface, no? Yeah, apparently. So it was, I think this, so the first index, last index, get log, they are, they are satisfying this um, log store interface that was implemented. I mean, that they mentioned in their readme, right? And then this set, 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 get, set during 64, uh okay, yeah so sets gets uh, this ones also satisfy the um stable store so i was like okay <laughs> so what does this come from so they said it's meant to be to be used as the backend for the raft package so i was like okay raft package let's go for that oh uh, let's check what that is about right so the raft package is a is a is a like is a package that implements the raft consensus and um as a raft consensus and allows you to like plug in your like some particular store so that brings the question of what exactly is the raft consensus or and like how i mean like how does it work so there's a paper there's a raft paper yes this link is broken actually so i posted oh this is not mm. The one, the one in the HashiCorp package is not broken, but the one oh, in yeah, the, the one in T two also was yeah. Okay. okay, so so yeah, I think this is where everyone like will pitch in. Right? I mean, those that probably went through or maybe we have questions, we can explore it within our time limits, really, right? So what I did was um, this package is a little bit large and has a bunch of stuff, but I think while I was investigating for some reason, 
I realized that the, the guy that released this this um this bond db package actually has his own um like a fork of raft itself right which is also a fork from the original ashikop thing so for some reason beyond my <laughs> i <laughs> it was the word i decided to like go through this um it's a little bit dated like it's outdated like um, like release 0 0.1.0, I guess, like 2017. But I figured that if it was based on a paper that was published a while back, um, it's the changes would not be would not be that much, or at least it, most of the basic concepts should be there to understand how bot DB uses it. Really. Oh, and I also I think the, the the my what's the word my justification was really that. This package is kind of duplicated, right? But because we just wanted to really know, so it means that ideally this package should most likely be compatible with with like its own fork back then. So that was one of the reasons why I just stuck with it. <laughs> Let's not get too confused. So I'll be going through Raft and how it plugs in and how Raft wants to be kind of plugs in through. Or well, since that was what I was trying to figure out all, all along. But if anyone is interested, I think on the on the on the on the um, Discord channel for this study, Raft um, Bonds TV, the link to this um, Raft consensus PDF is there. Um, I think these guys they put a summary, a summary of the protocol on their readme, so we could also read that. So this here is let me just do this. This here is the Raft, what's the word, Raft package that I cloned. Um, I mean, this is the same readme. So they say Raft's, Raft nodes are always in one of three states. That we follow a candidate or a leader. So I, I, I read the paper to some extent to like try and understand, <laughs> to try and understand what Raft is because it kind of helps to understand how, the pack, um, like how to navigate the package, I guess. So what I did was first thing first, I read through the paper, then I read this. So there's this short description here that kind of explains that there are nodes. Nodes are in either follower, candidate, or leader states. They all start out as followers, then they perform an election. Um, and based on the election, if people vote for you and then you get um is it you get elected, right? But still, I mean that doesn't really explain how the heck um <laughs> How the heck, like voting, has to do it <laughs> with uh, with the storage? Because the kind of the, we are dealing with. I mean, the focus was a key value store and how it works across a cluster, right? So the cluster, once a leader is elected, you accept a bunch of like log entries. Um, the leader accepts a bunch of log entries, and um, the client is the person like requesting from the leader. You can send like new log entries, and then the leader would, would the leader would handle writes. As a leader will handle like ensuring that all your entries are being written right across all the different followers like in the cluster, right? And then he ensures that um, yeah, it's committed, it's applied to a final state machine. Yeah, there's a bunch of stuff we need to go through. So in order to get ahead, I mean. I noticed there were a bunch of tests. So I saw this integration test and I was like, okay, maybe going through a test would help. Mostly because um, once I realized there was, so because this package is dated, some of the dependence, some of the things it depends on, uh, what's the word, uh, like a no more, should I say, is it no more existing or? So like this go metric is not existing. I think there was also another one. So for me, it was easier to just go it's through it. But it's moved, they've moved the location. Oh yeah, so uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> so yeah. it was for me to just go through the integration tests to find out like, okay, um, what tests or how to set it up basically. So I think that brings back to the question of, so it's the raft, should I say library, is not, is not a binary, right? Because I, I think Anthony earlier said he started out looking for a main function. 
right? I mean, ideally, I too, I was looking for a main function, right? Because I was like, mean, <laughs> and it came up with nothing. <laughs> so, um, it doesn't so it doesn't have, <laughs> so it doesn't, have, it doesn't have a main function. So, um, testing out the, I mean, checking out the test, uh, there was, I think there was a make craft. Make craft, so I, I mean, like, there's a bunch of stuff here, but I, I found out that this Makecraft was like to create all the different raft loops and kind of pair them up. So Makecraft does a bunch of um, like creates a, a memory store, creates a snapshot store. Uh, basically, I was looking for how do you create a raft, and then I saw this new raft guy. So clicking that, I realized that brought me into like a file, like a project file itself, and that was where I, I kind of found my entry point into the whole thing. Really, so I mean that's usually my approach. If I either can like use the package, or maybe if I if I'm lucky that it's a it's a library that has good tests, I just jump in through the test and find what I'm looking for, like kind of like how the test works. And then so apparently most of the meat of the logic is kind of in this raft node. And coincidentally, a new raft node takes in a log store and a stable store, right? <laughs> so that kind of answers my question, and I think I'm done. Any questions? <laughs> anyway, so it implements a log store and a stable store, which which is what our bond DB package implements to. Which is what our bond DB package implements. So uh, first thing I did was step into the log store to check. Interestingly, log store is an interface, of course, and it's I mean description is it's used to provide an interface for storing and retrieving logs in a durable fashion. So our uh, first index, last index, get log, store log, store logs, and delete range is what um, this our package implements here. So first index, last index, get log, store log, log. and it uses bonds to be underneath. So um, to understand what first index is and last index is, uh, uh, I don't know if if explaining. Um, so basically, the index is like the position of the log. <laughs> I think that makes that makes sense. Like it, it's, maybe you need to explain uh, rafts, like the terms raft and itself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let me see. This this paper has some diagrams, right? Mm, yeah. Oops, my internet is. I can you see him? Yes, we can. I can on this. Okay. Um, so yeah, I think I'm I mean I don't know how people okay, we have more people that oh okay. Um welcome to every new person, right? So I think um so the clients uh clients Raf um yeah, I think let me just wing it and <laughs> so basically the way I think the way Raf works. Probably maybe this is only a good way to um, anyone if you can if you have a better explanation maybe you can check it. But I think the way Rust works is Rust is a consensus um, like I think we all know what consensus is, but the simplest way to explain consensus is it's a way that multiple servers can come to agreement, right, on a particular this state on a particular state, right. So Rust Raft, Raft is the is it the definition, and uh, what Raft basically does is it's 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 it sets it's is it was it sets up the protocol for de determining who a leader is, and it basically says that the leader accepts requests from the client, right? And those requests they are called logs, right? And each log has um, an index that is the position of the log. Of the log entry, then it has a term. Term is like a number, but it's used to know it's like election term. So it's used to know if there's a new leader or a leader has changed. Um, there's a lot of intricacies to that. Maybe as we go through the raft implementation, we might understand better, right? The log type, uh, like if I mean if there's a <clears throat> if there's a um, like if it's so sometimes. Sometimes um, logs, the leader can send logs out to all the other members of the cluster, but doesn't like contain any data. It's just used to like send other information, right? So things like um, 
it's just a sender information like to say okay i'm still i'm still like i'm a ping like yeah ping like i'm still the leader it can be used to broadcast like um like yeah like there's a new pair and some other things really depending on your i think the the, the actual version might have some other stuff but yeah um then data is actually the data that we are trying to store but, i mean like the log data that we are trying to store right and um the peer is just yeah i don't know what that is yeah, so it's used internally, I think, to keep track. But basically, this the, the what's the word? The the protocol definition says that this this item should be sent right over, like over the wire, like an, an RPC call, right? So this log store they created it as an abstraction such that anyone can use their own store, like how they want to store the log information, right? So the first index is supposed to um, return the first index from a get log, from all get logs, I think. Yeah, um, from all get logs. The last index is supposed to return the last index from all, like, uh, sorry, from all store logs. Did I just say get log? From all store log operation, like the index from each of the store, right? So back to our bond DB implementation, I think it would make sense to start from store log. So um, store log calls this plural store log, and it does like a bond DB update transaction where it loops through all the logs, um, encodes them in a like in a, a byte because bond DB is kind of like a I think a key value um, key value like store um string store like you can't really store complex objects except you store it as bytes so so a code log a code log takes a raft log um this this structure here right and encodes it into a byte value after that it's it's just it's um it calls on the transaction of the call sets with um it sets it sets it with oh yeah it sets it with like um the like uh what's the word a prefix so db logs is a prefix l where's db logs yeah db log starts with l like it's just a namespace thing for for the um so db logs is like a prefix and then so it basically starts it with the prefix and um the index right so if we, if it's the first index it's causing if it's the first was the word um first entry first log entry so log indexes in raft starts with one starts from one like valid log index or valid indexes i guess indexes they start from one so i think zero means nothing um it's just a little sorting thing so this converts the integer to string because um, it's a key value string store and then it stores the value as a coded value right um so maybe we should look at the encode logic really. So the encode logic is it takes each of the um each of the log, what's the word, each of the log values. So it takes the data field, that is the bytes data, converts it. Ah, okay. So it creates a buffer. It creates a buffer to store all like I mean like a byte buffer, so to speak, but it's like a byte, yeah, a byte buffer to store, like to encode all the logic in. So first thing first is it for the first eight bytes, um, for the first, sorry, this this seven bytes, I think. Yeah, for the first seven bytes, it stores the index there, right? It uses this um, binary, um, little Indian, I don't know if that's, if, if, if anyone, if you know what little Indian is or big Indian. It's basically like a byte order thing, so. Maybe someone can share a link that will help people on the Discord channel because I, I don't know. It. But basically, it's, it's just, it's just kind of like a form. Yeah? Depending on the, the system architecture. So, different, some systems might, might be based on Little Indian, while others might be based on Big Indian. Yeah, yeah. So, I think, but but, I, I think the advantage of doing this is to ensure that we have a consistent Indian format when storing this. So, it's not like it's dependent on the internal systems implementation, right? So this forces that this forces the um, the this so-called put ins, right? 
when encoding the index as bytes. So I'll store it as a as little in the NDM. Right, so it stores so it stores in the first seven bytes um, the index, stores the next I think seven bytes the term, right, and then it copy okay then it stores in the sixteenth byte like the um, like yeah the six the fifteenth byte right or not the fifteenth byte it stores in the fifteenth byte the um, the type, right? And if, if we look at this, the type here is a is is a uh, unit eight, so it's a single byte, really. That's why it's storing that. It's storing that, and I, I mean, like, if you look at the type, so this is a sixty-four bits, which is a um, sixty-four bits is how many bytes? Uh, yeah, it's eight bytes. <laughs> So since four bits is eight bytes, eight bytes, this is um, eight bits, which is one byte, right? Then this is the byte length. So that explains why, oh, zero to eight. Yeah, sorry, I'm counting from one. So zero to eight is actually eight bytes. Uh, eight to 16 is eight bytes too, right? And that's why it's storing them in eight bytes, eight bytes, then starts the type in a single byte. Then from this, from like all the remaining stuff is, um, is the data is copied into, into that. Right, so I mean that's basically encoding logic, and also when it was creating the buffer, the buffer byte buffer here, it did seventeen, which is um, eight plus eight plus the one seventeen plus the length of the data. That's why it's like, and so that's how the encode logic works. The decode logic kind of does everything in reverse. So, um, given a particular byte, the byte buffer, um, this is like a validation to like if it is less than seventeen return. So what it just does is it decodes in little endian format the first eight bytes um the first eight bytes into index the next eight bytes into term the um, next byte into type and then it copies the remaining into data right so back to oops, back to store logs now so now store logs stores this right so how does it use how does it get the first index and the last index um it uses uh, what's this? What's um, this ascend function? I think Anthony talked about the ascend function. Um, we so because we know internally it uses. Yeah, this is Sorry. Is it not the one that works the entire tree? Yeah, it works. It works the entire tree. <laughs> I don't know how great that is, really. <laughs> but yeah. So <laughs> I I think it's a limitation of bonds DB, right? And yeah, I don't think there's, there's is, I mean, actually, I don't think, yeah, it has to work it. So I think it works, the, yeah, I but what it makes sense. I think this makes sense because in, in, in bonds DB, the keys are sorted by their binary order. So this would mean that, I mean, yeah, it's, 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 so this is always from the first one. Yeah. So I think it should be rather. Yeah, it actually makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so to get the first one, it ascends, it moves through the all the records, right? Um, this index thing is, I think it was, is like, it's to specify like a, an index that you want to ask walk through. An empty string means what? It's kind of like a prefix search. You use Sorry? it for prefix search. So oh, okay, really? Parameter. Yeah, so putting this means you don't want any prefix, you should ascend everything. And yeah, that's what, oh, okay, I actually thought it was like index. Anyways, but because I know that you can set some index and then each index has a different origin and you just accept that. But yeah, so but ideally we just want to accept like the default data. So it starts at the bottom and it checks if, um, so yeah, because we have two prefixes, one that starts with L, that's what we used to store our logs, right? So it checks mm -hmm. if, it, um, if it has a DB logs, if it starts with a DB log, if the key starts in db log, and what it does is it extracts the number. So returning false is telling the ascent function that stop ascending. Returning true means continue, right? So it says false, that is stop, but it has stored the um, first index value, right? And then it um, converts the string to int, um, to um, on site int, and returns it. So the last index does kind of the reverse. So it descends, that is, it starts from the highest log entry and kind of does the same thing. So, I mean, that's basically how 
is it burnt DB makes kind of efficient, makes it efficient um, to get the first index and the last index really. Um, I think I was, if, if it was there probably some other key value store that didn't allow this um, descend and ascend logic, probably would have, I don't know, maybe done some complex logic of probably yeah, catching sorry. the last, yeah. the last. Sorry, just go back. What you said was right about the um, ascend, it's the index. Oh, okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. so yeah, but there are no indexes specified here, so it's just a single like data. Mm -hmm. um, check out BondsDB to know more about indexes. <laughs> I don't know. I think we have some new people joining. Okay. Yeah, we looked at yeah, in our last call. Yeah, and um, on the Discord channel, I think there are some reviews and stuff. In the, so we can check that out. But yeah, so get log. Um, get log does the normal key value stuff. Just the prefix plus the index. Um, it returns the value. If it wasn't found, returns not found. Or else uses our decode logic to return the, the, to return the data. Right, so I think that kind of that kind of fills in how bonds DB store and um, like how bonds DB Rust bonds DB works with the Rust library, right? And I think some people might, but I, I don't think that does justice until I don't know, like how does log store <laughs> how does log store work inside the Rust package? So I mean that was where I went. I, I went deeper, right? Yeah. So I think uh, um, I mean maybe it's not time to mention this yet, but. Here he's using bonds DB to store the logs, as well as using bonds DB as the regular database, which is supposed to be useful. But okay. I saw another implementation by him called uh, WAL right ahead log, where he he also has a different bonds uh, raft implementation, but he does the he stores the raft stuff to a file or to memory instead of instead of to bonds db ah okay and yeah i mean it's it's this guy right yeah i think it's this package that's yeah but, but i mean like what other so what, i mean if that's the right head log is is um is it just writes to the like to the file and that's all no yeah. so i think the main uh, interesting thing is just to mention to take note of the fact that you don't necessarily need to use a database for the login part of Raft. Oh yeah, I mean that, I think that's why they abstracted it out into an interface. Um, mm. as, as interface. Yeah, they, they, I mean they moved it out into an interface really. So there's 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 the log store and then the stable store, right? Um, the the log store is important because it it deals mostly with logs, right? And the way Raft works is it needs to replicate a bunch of logs to all, everyone in the cluster. Like the leader needs to replicate a bunch of logs to everyone in the cluster. And then it's, the leader needs to tell them that apply this set of logs to your, like to be committed to your store, so to speak, right? Um, so stable store is used, it provides a stable storage, um, like, set an arbitrary key gets like arbitrary bytes uh, because it's arbitrary bytes i think that's where you can kind of use use it to any form of like any let's say any form of information provided you can um, provide a particular encoding so the set and get implementation in, in bonds db is bond store is simple it does it sets um, you, so instead of using the db logs prefix now, it uses the db conf prefix, which is like a C. What the? Yeah, it uses db, which is a C with um, this guy, right? Then it appends the key and then um, string v, um, yeah, like bytes, stores the bytes, but that's the key value string. So um, it so, says, um, then, yeah. Yeah, I think he does that to demarcate between um, all the other things he wants to store, which are not really yeah. related. Yeah, okay. I mean, yeah, because I think that's, I mean, that's, that's the only way you can technically do that in a key value store. You yeah. can't, um, like there's not, I mean, prefix is like, is, is like the, <laughs> is like what's the word, it's like the, the table. <laughs> <laughs> and collections. <laughs> Yeah, so like you do a lot of prefix matching and stuff to ensure, right? So I think, 
put PS under that DBConf layer also. He said like he, he could have put... Like, he puts peers, like, every peer that registers. I oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, so this peers is, a, is um, well, yeah, it's, so apparently he did this peers, but I don't think it's not, it's, what's the, yeah, it's a peer store, actually. I think that's the word. Yeah, it's a peer store, but I didn't really pay attention to that. Okay. So apparently he implants a peer store, too, that was needed by the raft library, right? So now, yeah. I think, the become and then prefixes the becomes in front of PS. Oh, okay, yeah. Oh, really? He's also mm. using. No, I, I, I. Um, set PS. If you go to this set implementation. You mean this? I think if you go. I think it's just using PS and the data. I think. Can you go to this um set B that set? You mean this? Yes, that one. Oh, okay, um, yeah, I'm sorry, imagine. <laughs> I can't presume it as TX set. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, yeah, so I mean, yeah, so that would be like the dbconf prefix and ps, and I don't think yes. there should be any conflict with that. Right? So yeah, yeah, you also made it a ps store. So ideally, when, if you wanted to use that bond db with all of this, I think we'll just like, you initialize a new bond store, and then you can pass it as the log store, stable store, and PS store um, implementation for your raft mode. And it will handle like using both DB logic and stuff for, for like that particular um, like instance in the cluster. Right. So um, I tried going through to really figure out where log store is being used. Um, this it, it got if well, yeah, without. And I think it, it was worth noting, so I don't know if, if everyone probably knows about that one. Like, so this implementation here is not some sort of like gold standard, so to speak, right? Um, it is, I think it was just, it was trying to adhere to the white, to the, is it white paper now? The Raft protocol specification paper, really. And the protocol specification paper doesn't necessarily, like it doesn't, um, this paper, it doesn't necessarily like give implement, should I say implementation details? It's more like specification details of different things that can be done or that should be done, really. So, so bearing that in mind, like if you don't, if I mean, like if you were to check out some other like, like Raft implementation, they might not necessarily have like this log store, stable store. This is just this library's way of abstracting out the storage layer from the core protocol logic itself, right? Um, yeah, and all these all these are actually interfaces, so <laughs> they cannot change to anything really when initializing it. Okay, <clears throat> so going hey, one second. This... Can you can you just open that transport interface? I just want to check. Oh, okay, I think it's so okay. it defines a bunch of actions. Um, this is yeah the address. Um, yeah, lot. Okay. yeah, but I think this these are the important ones. Yeah, this one's right. Yeah, like request to the protocol. Yeah, yes. like to submit. And then the heartbeat. Oh the yeah, heartbeat. set heartbeat handler. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but this so like yeah, I said, I almost everything is problem. just is like how this library is trying to implement the protocol really. Right. So on when you want to launch a Rust node, um, so like take for example, I'm, I'm back in an integration test here. Um, integration test. So in an integration test, let me look for. Yeah. So in this integration test, they started out by running, um, like creating four Rust nodes with um, their different addresses and like adding, adding, what's the word? Adding, adding them as peers. So like they know each other, right? So in calling this new raft, assumes that you are creating, a, what's the word? Like creating a node, right? A node that communicates with using this transport and uses this peer store to keep track of peers, uses snapshots to snapshot stuff. <laughs> then a stable store uses the log store to keep track of logs from everyone. And there's a finite state uh, machine, which um, 
<clears throat> which basically is like a finite is a is a yeah is a is a, is a FSM, a state machine that given a particular input updates the internal state. Really. So it's also an interface. I think let me just quickly do. It's also an interface that takes in the logs and says apply it right. And um, yeah, this output is optional, but it's 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 like that's so this protocol specific I think. So it's not really defined as anything. It can be anything as long as all your rat servers understand each other. So using that, starting a new, a new um, what's the word? Starting a new node. First thing it tries to do is, yeah, I guess the current term. Uh, so this is this here. This is where the stable store gets. Should I say starts getting used, right? Um, the current term is 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 uh, is is was <laughs> is, 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 is is I mean if you are starting a new node and you, you are part of a particular and uh, like a previous cluster like let's say you shut down and you start up again right I think Bond DB has a way of storing stuff inside that so if you start up with the same Bond DB interface with connected to the same file right it would create like it would reload like who was the what, what term was I on previously, right? So you need to know the current term, then also get the last index, and um, yeah, tries to fetch the last log. If if there is no last log, it returns this error. And um, sorry, if there's an error while fetching the last log, right? Because it takes, it passes this as a, a pointer. If, it, if there's a hero, it throws a hero. And so after that, uses the peer store to get um, the existing peers. Uh, I don't know what exclude peers means, but I think the exclude peer yeah, is, a, is, a, is a utility function. All it just does is it removes the current, um, the current node's address. The current node address from the list of peers because I think it doesn't make sense for me to consider myself with peer with my peers. Then creates this raft, the raft, um, in, uh, this struct with the FSM. The so there are a bunch of like so I think this library works because there are a bunch of things going on in parallel, right? So it deals mostly it uses channels to communicate. Um, I really don't know how to, but I'm assuming the channels are well set up, really. <laughs> so, but yeah, so he has like an apply channel to communicate um, when when to apply some logs, um, FSM channel to commit to commit, which we call apply channel to apply. Um, there's a leader channel to I think to know um, to know when a leader has changed. I mean, all these channels probably going through. You understand. <clears throat> so if if you specify like. So but yeah, as for the specification, when starting a node, a node should start up as a as a follower first. Uh, you start up as a follower, but here yeah, I think you can you can like specify a config to start it up as a leader. Maybe if you are trying to do some control test, because yeah, I said this should only be used for testing purposes. Yeah. Then so based on the current term, we set the current term. So I mean, all this these are all initialization stuff, right? Um, snapshots is to restore the previous. Um, State snap. This is the state snapshot if it was stored. Uh, I think you can look at that. The way it does is it it runs three parallel go routines. Yeah, go routines. Thank God. Something I mentioned. I'm on. So go routines. Um, it runs. There's a run. There's a run FSM, <clears throat> and it runs snapshot. Really. So I think my focus mostly with respect to like raft and logs was this run. So this guy is running in parallel, right? And what it does basically is it runs this this loop to check um, if there's a shutdown. It resets. It like clears its leader and then like I think initializes shutdown, right? <clears> oh, <throat> because I think on shutting down, it's probably going to move the like the broadcast with the leader is to all its peers and probably not. But I don't know. I didn't really look into that. So but now, so based on the current states, because um, a a a raft node or a raft node can either be a follower, can be a candidate or a leader. So the difference is a follower is 
basically waiting for instructions from the leader, from a known leader on the cluster. That is the leader that sends in logs and everything for replication and applying them internally, right? Uh, the candidates, the candidates, uh, what's the word? A, a, a node becomes a candidate when it realizes that it can no more talk to his leader and it wants to be, it wants to become the leader, right? So it becomes a candidate. Then, so as a but, candidate, they can, a, sorry? Yeah, but every um, node usually has some random timeouts when it just decides to be a candidate. And yeah, so, that's that's yeah. the time. Okay, so as in, was it when, when the time out is leader. Sorry, you said. So even if it's able to reach the, you know, it still becomes a candidate. Just that, you know. No, um, it doesn't. Oh, but, no, that's the no. Yeah, Hello. Yes, yes, okay. Sorry, sorry. Yes. Yeah, I'm listening. Yeah, I'm saying uh, each node only attempts to start an election that's getting to a candidate state and request vote from other nodes if it can't receive a heartbeat from the leader after it's a heartbeat timeout. So they listen for heartbeats and after a certain period, if they don't hear from the leader, they switch to uh, switch to candidate status that starts an election. They increment the current term, then vote for themselves and then request votes for, for other uh, candidates. That's how it starts an election. Yeah, so I mean, like, the logic is kind of here already. So, like, if, so, you know, while this is polling, like, the sub-FSM, while it's, like, in a follower state, it runs this follower logic, right? And what this does is it's, it has this heartbeat timer, which is a random, random, like, a random timeout that you can configure the minimum value of, right? And um, this returns, I think, some a ticker or so. Yeah, a ticker, I guess. So when, if that happens, um, if that happens, it resets the timer, the timer, and then it checks the last time, like it got a contact from the leader. If the time is less than the actual timeout, it continues. That is nothing has changed because I've been getting like, um, like I've I've been contacted within the last was the, the last time out, so it's okay. But if it doesn't, it tries to get the, who, was, who the last leader was. Um, I think, I don't know what that is for. But at the end of everything, it sets itself as the candidate, right? It sets state as candidate. So when mm -hmm. on certain, mm -hmm. yes. You said? Oh, okay. So it sets itself as candidate. Yeah, I just means, realized, yes. Oh, okay. So which means like, it sets itself as candidate and returns. So which means this function here, stops like finish running and then we enter this like all run thing again now the person is a candidate so you run the server as candidate now the candidate basically is saying that um i want to be i, I want to run for election <laughs> yeah i think that's the thing. i want to run for election right now i know it's because I, initially i thought it was kind of it doesn't make sense because it means everyone becomes a candidate immediately uh, <laughs> I can imagine if everyone in Nigeria becomes a candidate as once. <laughs> so, but I don't know. I don't know. I think they explained. They explained how somewhere in the paper. But let's not assume the logic works. They explain how, and I think the, the idea is behind an election timer, which is also random, to kind of ensure that everyone gets. Yeah, I think they explained that. Like, if to, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I think they explained that if two, like say two nodes um, become candidates at the same time, I think. So when that happens, they won't, they would, those two nodes will vote for themselves and the other nodes will kind of be split. So there won't really be a leader. So what will happen is that they'll reset their timeouts again. And yeah, exactly. they reset randomly. It means that the next time they reset, only one node would I mean, it's more likely that just one node would, um, would yeah. go to elections instead of two. So yeah, I mean, yeah. So I mean, that's so. I mean, that's basically the wrong candidate thing. So what happens here is now I think bearing in mind. So there's this for loop that says I don't get states if it's a candidate, right? Um, 
I think so. This loop runs while the, the current node is still a candidate, and I think it's because there are some other bunch of go routines, uh, um, go routines that are listening to some channels that could update the state. So, so either way, while the person is still a candidate, right? It listens on a bunch of channels. Um, and while they are candidates, it can process. It can still process logs. But I think the important thing is this vote channel here, right? Yeah, I think you can process logs or process RPC requests, not necessarily logs. But this apply, it cannot commit, it cannot like verify and all that stuff. <clears throat> oh yeah, it can still set its peers too. Oh, oh really? So if, if, if it gets a broadcast that there, there are new peers joining, it becomes a follower back. I think that's like an edge case. I didn't even notice that. By the way, this, this is the voting logic I think here, right? So what it does is um, when it's running as a candidate, it creates a variable. Excuse me. Oh, okay. Sorry, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Hello? I can hear you. Oh, okay, okay. Um, my headset dropped. So, uh, so yeah, it, creates, uh, it keeps track of votes, right? And then the votes needed. So the vote needed is basically, uh, let's, let's see, is like half, more than half, yeah? Sorry, wait. oh yeah, quorum size. Yeah, the votes needed is the quorum size, which is kind of like half plus one. I think that's the best explanation. So it takes the length of what all the peers is connected to divide by two and then add one so that is if majority of um of everyone votes for me or votes for for the person he becomes the leader right so that's the votes needed that's how you got the votes needed right so looking at the the vote logic so after after uh, what is what after after doing votes needed uh so where does he exactly Yeah, where does it exactly now send it? <laughs> oh, how does it work? Yeah, I think. I know it's. It, yeah, it's actually weird. How does it broadcast? Oh, wait, can I check this? Ah, yes, I missed something. This elect self. So, yeah, this is where, like, broadcasting that you are the new candidate, right? So it calls the next self on itself, which um, creates this RPC request that um, votes for me, um, which it specifies this current term that is, uh, yeah, before you, before, you, um, before you send your current term, you have to increment it as far as code process, increment your term when you become a candidate. And then, so it sends this current term that is, we are going for a new term with a new, uh, with a new leader. It sends this address. Um, he sends his address, then he sends his um, like his last log index, that is, and the last term he got for a log. All logs have a term. I think we already discussed logs, but right. Then for then he loops through all his peers and sends them an ask request. So the ask request is basically sending this request to every peer. Um, that is, so that, that's why the transport layer has a request votes um, interface. So I mean, I mean, so the, the advantage of, of, the, of the transport layer really is of the interface of the transport layer. It means that your RAS implement or your RAS clusters could be talking with different things, right? They could be talking with simple like TCP. Some the encoding thing could be different. They could what's the word? They could be using gRPC. Um, I think the implementation they have in here was using message pack. So. Um, as a message pack to encode the data that is being sent through TCP. But anyways, <clears throat> so yeah, so just the call the request go to your transfer layer, which will handle all the logic. And if there's an error, if there's an error, revert the term, then yeah, so okay, yeah, this is the response. <laughs> So it just automatically says granted false. And that's the like graph protocol says return granted false. And yeah, so I mean, so this select self is what sends the um, request, vote to, um, request vote to everyone, right? And then what it now does is it returns this response panel, which is the panel um, containing the rest, like 
that listens to all, all the peers response, right? So that's why when they get a response, it passes it to this channel and then the channel is returned here. So, um, let me go back to you. So back to our own candidate, elected itself returns the vote channel and that is what it is listening to here, right? To get everyone's response. So whenever any of the other peers respond, we get their votes. So it checks if their term, if the person responding has a term that is that is greater than his own term. It means that that person, it means that he, is it the candidate is already behind. So there's someone else that is that has been elected, or there's some sort of like election, other elections that could have gone on. So take for example, if actually I don't know what example would happen, but maybe like this node went down, right? And then it starts up, and our like our our is it log store. Our log store like reloads persistent data, right? And on our persistent data, we are behind. But then our our the leader we are connected to before we went offline is no more online. We automatically promote ourselves to candidate, right? And then I send out my votes to all my peers. But if my other if my other peers have moved on and they have um like they have what's the word? They have other uh other can like they have a new leader rather it means that i'm a follower but also it could also mean i don't know it could mean something else really but if you become a follower like the cycle could continue the follow-up could end up becoming a candidate and realizes there's no new leader and all that stuff so it sets the current term to the time it got as a response and then it automatically breaks out of this right but because that set is set to follower it will fall back into the outer um like Alta is it FSM, uh, final state machine, and then continue. But if 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 the if the terms are still are less or equal, it it checks that if it, it checks if they actually granted him like if he was voted, then if he was granted, he says granted as he increases his his total granted votes, right? Now you know at the head of each one, he checks that if his granted votes is greater than his vote needed, he sets himself as the leader. And it sets the leader address to his own address, that's his own address, and returns. So at this point now, he's the leader, right? Um, I don't know, is that clear so far? I think that's kind of straightforward. And technically, this is how the RAS protocol kind of specifies how the whole candidate thing works, really. Uh, if there's any confusion, probably consult the paper. So, uh, so now that after the candidates like loop has run and the leader is elected, it kind of comes like it returns. So this comes back to this for loop, right? Now the state is probably a leader. Then it runs the leader loop instead of the leader subroutine or final state machine. Yeah, any of those kind of apply, right? Um, so there's a bunch of stuff here. I don't really uh, like so because. The, the leader's job is where the meat of everything is because the function of the leader is to actually accept like requests into the cluster and replicate it to everyone. So it's, it's, it has to do with a lot of, um, what's the word? Uh, what's the, like, let me, let me, this DeFi is like clean up logic when, if mm -hmm. you are no more a leader, so let me just close that. So what it does, when it becomes a leader is it's, it, it loops through all its peers, everyone on its peers list, and um, calls start replication for each of them. Uh, I think the replication mm. basically is to ensure that all the peers catch up to his own current log, right? So take for example, there's this example here. So take for example, this, this is, let's assume this person becomes a leader, right? These are his own log entries. Um, this one's, so this one, one, one means this was on the first term. This two means second term. That is, there was a different leader here. Then this third term is probably this leader's term. So when I become a, or oh, yeah, I don't know. Let us assume I become a leader, right? So the replication does is it goes through all my peers and ensures that these missing ones are replaced to try and get all of them up to my own sticks. I think that visual explanation ex should explain what start replication does. If you have any question, you can ask on the Discord, I guess. <laughs> or ask here, actually. If you have any question. On the paper. <laughs> no, just, just ask if you have a question. 
So I think after doing the replication thing, although I think this should be asynchronous, I'm not sure. So looking into what Stack Replication does, yeah, it's asynchronous really. It's called the Go function here because it doesn't make sense to block on everyone. So it just like pushes it to one of them um, asynchronously. Um, this is the like the replication data channels to get to get information from them and all that stuff. Um, so let me just go back. So yeah, on doing that, uh, after that is done, it's because, like it's not blocking, so we're not waiting for all of them. Just look in front of them, send their requests, and comes back to logic. So it does a bunch of, <laughs> uh, I don't know what, all these are like a lot of stuff. Then it starts its leader loop, really. So what the leader loop does is, <laughs> While I mean, like we can see a pattern here, right? So while it runs a loop, that is while um, the current node is still a leader, right? And bear in mind, I think if we start like if we start like four or five last nodes, each and every one of them is running this loop, right? So while one is a leader, the other one is running the um, the, the um, followers loop, like waiting for input and stuff. So the leader's job basically is to get RPC request. I think this is from like external like clients. Uh, thank God this paper has like some. So the RPC request is from clients that is um, request into the server, right? So it gets requests, process requests, and then pushes them to follow up. Um, here is is I don't know if it gets a step down. Yeah, there's a bunch of stuff really, like it's huge. I don't know maybe if um, anyone has gone through most of them, but I think we might want to go through this process RPC function. <laughs> uh, so process RPC is where we get people's requests, where we get requests really. Um, I don't I don't think the source really matters right now. <laughs> By the way, so the requests as far as the specification or at least when I was reading, there's the append entries, which is basically append a, 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 a log, what's the word? Append a log entry, which is a very straightforward append um, log entry, creates an RPC, then sends it to all the peers. What? Yeah, shoot. Okay, I'm confused. I think I'm mixing things up. But see, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So the append entries log, actually it, it's not only for sending logs. I think I mentioned that before. I think I mentioned that it's not only for sending logs, it can also be used for other things. Right, right, according to the paper. It's um, also used as a heartbeat. Yeah, you can use it as an heartbeat. Um, Okay, let's maybe we'll go through this to see what happens. Append is invoked when we get an append entry RPC call, right? Um, it's, so if the, if the term, so all requests, I think, have a term, right? So if the term is less than the current term, we return it. Um, if, if the term is greater than the current term, okay, yeah, so if the term is less than the current term, that is, uh, if where's that scare? That is if uh, like if I'm already on state on yeah. time three, yeah. right? And someone is sending a time two query to me, uh, like it's time two log to me. I just ignore it. But if the time is greater than my current the current time I'm on, right? And I am not a follower. Oh yeah, so if I'm if I'm the current leader, right? If I'm the current leader, and for some reason I'm getting something that. That is not um, that that is greater than my current term, like my leadership term. I set myself as a follower. It means somebody else has conducted a candidate election and the person has become the leader. Yeah, this protocol is it feels very chaotic, but it works. <laughs> yeah, when I read it, it's actually simple. Like it, yeah, that's I like, read it and watched the video. It's yeah, same. It's brilliantly simple. I mean, I'm surprised it's this simple. <laughs> I mean, parts of those, parts of those yes. are complex. Considering all the things that can go wrong in a distributed system, <laughs> the, the protocol is quite simple. Yeah. Uh, just I mean, just that they, they, they traded off some things, though. You know, it's that simple, but 
you know, can't I, I think there is you can't still, use it for yeah, I think there is still possibility of data loss in this raft system. You know, with the way um they handle like merging their logs. Yeah, yeah. I, like I think I think the the worst that would happen. Yeah, I think so actually you should like you know, I think I mentioned that earlier too that. If you feel there are some things inconsistencies, I think the paper tried to prove many of those things. But still, I still feel that there are some gaps that I think it's like mathematics, really, where like <laughs> there's a you, in your mind you feel this thing should not make sense, but there's a formal proof somewhere that says it makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there is a possibility of data loss, but the pos- the the uh your protocol is concerned with the consistency of the logs replicated on the server than the uh, durability of data that the client has. So if you are the client using, uh, you're using Raft on DB now as your storage backend and it's replicated yeah. on different machines using Raft as a, a protocol. Your client application that's trying to store things can lose data, but the data stored on all those machines, the uh, the cluster of machines that are acting as one, will always be in. Yeah, no. They always be consistent. We don't. So that's that. We're that's, about that's what the people are. Yeah. Is, yeah, but yeah, the possibility of data loss is that yeah. is that what you send, say what your application sends now to this your uh, raft cluster, you can the, the cluster may not even save the data. Uh, you can lose yes, data there. Exactly. So it might not get replicated. Like it, it might replicate, but let's say another leader is already exists that has like a more up to a, a more like a more updated log, and then yeah. just describes yeah. your own data. <laughs> yes, that that's it. So your your application might lose data you try to send because it's not replicated. But the advantage is that the the log will remain consistent. It's not the that, ones that gets no. replicated <laughs> will be consistent. Yes, the ones. Yeah. The so now you have to handle that possibility that your data was not stored. Yeah. So I mean, like, it, it makes sense, I guess. <laughs> so, but okay, I think maybe so. Yeah, this this kind of explains most of where have gone through. Then I think the last thing I really wanted to I don't know talk about um, because the truth is I think some people going through all this might I mean like usually I, after this I'm like okay so how can this be used right so I think the, well at least for me or let me um, because they, since they allow us to have a blog store right and then they also have some sort of finance I think there's a finance state machine that applies logs mm. that applies that I'm sorry that lets you apply log to change the states. So it means that this FSM can be used for like other operations. Not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily mean to be storage really, right? So um of course. Can be for commands for like, that Yeah. So like take for example, let me let me go back to um yeah. So the raft, right? Now I could provide an FSM implementation that, um, so I mean like, okay, so I think the first thing is, RAF ensures that whenever I get, as one of my requests comes in with a particular arbitrary log data, right? The, the I mean, this, this data is actually what <laughs> your specific implementation is working with. All these index and terms, how, um, what's this thing called? How RAF itself functions, right? As in like how RAF itself ensures that your, your log data is, as in your log data is in order. Now, what happens is all these guys, I think once, once the leader ensures that a bunch of these guys are up to date, right? It tells them to apply their logs. It tells them to apply the log to like their, what's the word, their, their finite state machine, right? So um, a finite state machine is, I don't, if, if you don't know what a finite state machine is, can you just let us know? To be sure I'm not speaking. I think most people here know, okay, that's good. <laughs> so a finite, so yeah, it applies it to the finite state machine. So I was, I was just I thinking of like- I don't know what it is though. 
Sorry, who? Me, David. Okay, I think this, the simplest implementation is, is uh, this is the simplest explanation is a final state machine is a machine that has a bunch of like specific states that um, that's an, as in, like a, a number of specific states that are known and each can be triggered by a particular action, right? So uh, I don't know if I, I think there's a, a yes. So take for example, this diagram now. This is, a, this is like some sort of a finite state machine like um, specification for this RAFT, right? So we know that your RAFT nodes can either be a follower, a candidate, or a leader. Those are the states, right? Oh, and okay. then, so there's a start, yeah, that also is also defined by a starting point. So there's a starting point on startup, all everyone becomes a follower, right? And when an action, for example, if the follower's timer exceeds without him getting any ping from the leader, it automatically transitions into a candidate state, right? Yeah. If a new election timer um, elapses right, before, cool. because, yeah, so, I mean, like, yeah, that's, yeah. that's, that's, I get, I get this part. You have a thing before. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, this is a finite state machine. So now, inside this, well, I mean, wait, maybe I can give a simple example. Like um, one example of a of a finite state machine could just be like when you do a bank track. Okay, sorry, my example is not that simple. <laughs> sorry. I think the simplest example you can use is a button on a web page. Say you load the page and the button always starts out disabled because you've not entered your form data or something, your email. Yeah, password. okay, I was not thinking in terms of distributed system, right? I mean, like a button is kind of not that distributed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just right, so only, that, only on the events that you've like entered that. your, yeah. So like, I, 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 I okay, I think brilliant.org, yes. I remember this. I think it's just big English. Like in yeah, my, in, 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 in my current company that we work in, it's a food delivery company. So we have like a finite state machine that just tracks the state of delivery. When the order is placed, there's a state for that. When it's been dispatched, yeah, exactly. there's a state for that. So, so exactly. So, okay, good, good. Like, I was even looking for an example and how we can actually use, like, let's say we, we have a bunch of servers now and how we can use this old, like, Rust library to implement such a thing. So that's what I wanted to kind of, like, explain or what I was, like, thinking of and probably coming up with an example or anyone can come up with an example, right? So I think we can use this example here, for instance. I know I'm looking for uh, uh, yeah, Anthony, you just mentioned something about delivery. Um, so, like, yeah, so let's assume that uh, there's a, like there's an order, like other states, right? Yes. An other state that is like <laughs> right. So, so ideally, like, what would be in this data here? this log data would be these actions like press nothing so because our i mean this is just arbitrary bytes we could just encode our normal byte strings right so press um press nothing press blah blah blah, blah. sorry press nothing what the heck yeah press nothing press nothing yeah, whatever whatever oh yeah this is a controller game controller <laughs> uh so so what happens is in, in the game controller now when the person presses so let's assume our client is the game controller, right? So on starting, like this is our starting state, the, the, the person is, is standing, right? And let's assume like our last node is, is, is what is the word? We are having like some sort of consistent, we are trying to ensure that the state is consistent so that even if our servers go down, we can still get the state and let every other person see where they stopped in their game. So when the person presses up, um, I will send a request to the stuff, to the, what's the word, to the leader with this, was this, this data, with our data saying um, up, right? Yeah, let's say up, it says up, right? The protocol behind this scene handles ensuring that um, this, our data gets appended to, gets appended to this, this, this entry here. So we get like up, down, six, and everything, everything. Now the leader now says, the leader after a while, I think, after a while, the leader now calls commit on our finite, sorry, calls apply. 
an RS state machine, right? So what is this? I mean, there are, I don't know if there's any technical implementation in this code because, yeah, there's one. So yeah, I mean, this is a mock FSM really. But all this one just does is still append the logs. But ideally, what you should do is taking the log, take the data from the log, and then if I think yeah, if if it is up, it will. If it is up and the previous state was stand, it 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 moves the person to run, right? If it is, I think everything is up. Yeah, so something more small. If it's A now, like if the person press A on his pad, right? You need to ensure that the previous state, which I don't know for some reason, I feel this apply should probably take the previous state. Oh, uh, okay, maybe it assumes the FSM as the memory, like as like. Probably is backed by some storage, I mean. But anyway, so the actual yeah, is an, an FSM is stateful, so it must be backed by some kind of like the previous um, states memory. Uh, yes, yeah. so it will have its own the current states as a previous state. Okay, so yeah, so all the so all the protocol is all the protocol is actually monolithic. Sorry? Most FSMs are usually like like actual states, like either there's a database where they are tracking the state. And yeah, or, yeah. Um, so my, yeah. I was I was thinking of something more like a reducer. That, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, all the protocol cares really cares about is is um is this uh, was this um log entries like each action, right? So you are now supposed to um. And do your logic of what happens when an action is applied to the previous state, right? Then this snapshot here is is also yeah the protocol kind of asks for a snapshot really, but is to ensure that everyone has I think the same snapshot states. Well, yeah, I mean like I mean like that was that was where I was going to, and for lack of a good example, really, I was trying to think of a simple solution. Uh, it was what a simple implementation. But yeah, I mean, that's, that is where it applies to the external world using this library. You have your FSM implementation passed in, you have your log store, efficient log store. In reality, all this could probably, I mean, like if you are working on this, I don't know what, I don't know if you need a small project, I mean, like need draft for a small project, but if you're working on a small project and like all this could probably be invented and be backed by the same story. But yeah, I think that kind of explains, as we've seen how bond to be efficiently allows for a log store and a stable store. Um, yeah, I do really, I mean, there's, there's a bunch of stuff like you mentioned. <laughs> there's a bunch of, there are other things, but the, the call was inside, um, is inside this raft, raft function. All the others are like um, states and many other stuff. Yeah, I think that was that was really where I stopped really. Um drilling down into the into the how the protocol ensures its state works. But yeah, a bunch of stuff, snapshots, committing. Yeah. <laughs> and like I said, I mean this is just can we look at how the transport is implemented? Oh, okay. So um there is no not to speed net. I think that's the important point. Net transport, yeah. So uh, I think, yeah, so this is the transport interface, right? So this transport interface, I mean, you could pass anything in. Um, that as long as, I think we're all doing both. We're all familiar with both, so we know what interface is like. We're moving on. <laughs> um, so yeah, the new transport, the new, so um, there's, they have a network transport. Yeah, I think that's right. There's a network transport that is implemented like in the code. Or that is exported by the code to make things easier, like creating a network transport. But it doesn't necessarily need to be a network transport. So the network transport, the way it works is it takes in a stream layer. A stream layer is is an interface that implements the um I dot, let's say dot net, the Go Net um, listener interface, right? And also has this extra dial. Like to create an out, outgoing connection. Um, I don't know if you are familiar with Go. I think this should be more like you know what the next interface is. So so yeah, so it takes a stream layer, like something that implements that, right? 
but the it, it handles all the other logic of like um if adding like the pool of connections to the different peers and all that so this is consumer channel what? Yes, I think it's the consumer channel which which is used to get um, this, any requests from any of the connections like the RPC calls right all those RPC calls were just checking and local addresses to get the address from the stream um, the stream um, it's shut down and that's the it's shut down then this is like a connection like connection pool logic blah 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 so given a particular peer's address it returns the connection for that peer from his connection pool um i think like so like there's a pool i, I yeah connect, i don't know if anyone has implemented the connection pool or something just it's basically to, uh, to prevent uh, the, um, yeah i have just i think they're just trying to reduce having to do handshakes for each request and yeah, I mean, that's what, like I said, um, it doesn't, so, I mean, this one's an internal stuff. So back to the transport interface. So the append entries pipeline is used, is used to send a request. So this target here is the address of the peer, right? That's what our um, REST protocol uses. So if there's a, if it wants to send, um, if it wants to send to all its peers, it calls the transport with append entries, with, no, sorry, with append entries, <laughs> Sorry, I don't know what this pipeline is actually. <laughs> but it calls this guy with append entries, specifies the um, the the person's address, the arguments for the append entries, that is the leader term, blah blah blah, the entries, the log entries to append, and then the leader's last commit index. Right? So, so the commit index is to keep track of the last time that they were told to apply all the logs. But anyways, then this pointer is to return the response. Um, request votes, similar thing. Uh, so this generic RPC is what they all use underneath to um, send. So what it does is it uses that, uh, sorry, it, uses, it calls send RPC, passes the connection, passes the connection, the connection that it gets from the stream like the stream, um, sorry, yeah, if, if, if it gets from the stream. So now this is, I mean, this guy assumes as a stream. So they also had a TCP transport, right? So what TCP transport is, TCP transport implements that stream layer thing, right? So what it does is new TCP transport creates that same network transport, but instead um, passes, uh, passes a function, that creates the stream layer, um, the stream layer. Yeah, sorry, I uh, made, wait, what? Okay, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> so it, it calls this guy internally that, either way, Sha, this TCP layer implements TCP transport. <laughs> like um, dialing, using the next package, accept, yeah. uh, Closes and all that. Um, yeah, just the usual. Okay, I guess that means so we could easily me, replace this with say GRPC yeah. or yeah, exactly. So I mean, like this yeah, transport is to like GRPC transports, where all it does needs to do is implement these functions: append entries, pipeline, append entries, taking in the person's address. Yeah, but from yeah. But from what I see, it seems it has to be a synchronous um, connection. Like you can't say throw in a message queue and use a message queue to communicate between the nodes. And well, I think you can. That is why all, if you notice, all responses have this thing they call, no, sorry. It's like, I mean, the, the responses that matter, like for example, this, they have something they call like last log and all that stuff, right? So, yeah, but Okay, but uh, okay, maybe it can be changed oh. in the implementation. But with the interfaces here, they are more of a get a request, return a response. For example, the voting, when you make a vote, they expect a response that includes the votes immediately. Hey, but you know, it's async, right? They, I think they, they respond with channels. So it's not like a blocking. Yeah, but, that's that. But then also, I think 
the truth is really is that i mean if you are dealing with a safe machine right and you want things to be predictable you solve somehow somehow you need to ensure that things don't just enter randomly yeah true although i know the protocol undoes that but i think i get what you mean like you're saying and also the operation should not be long running right because i think the only wrong one in the operation is the is the actual commit like the applying stage of when you want to apply a log to a particular like to the states right uh the that, that should that can be a long running process maybe trying to do some other stuff but the actual drpc calls um like append entries yeah append entries can also be used to commit um i think the commands are here if i'm correct yeah Yeah, but I mean, either ways, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, I get what Anthony is saying. Um, the Raft aims to make a group of servers, a cluster, uh, strongly consistent. So you can't just put a message queue as the uh, communication mechanism. Raft, the paper itself specifies RPC for communication. If you yeah. want to put a message queue there, you have to put a message queue that guarantees order delivery because most message queues don't guarantee a delivery order they just guarantee that the, the message will be delivered somehow so if your message queue does not you want to put it such that you uh, you persist messages in the message queue so that you don't drop messages and then uh, the message, you, must, you must ensure order delivery yeah what advantage you could have had i mean i, I understand what you are saying and that it makes sense I, I just mentioned that you know it just means you, you can't do asynchronous communication. But one advantage that could have had been had from asynchronous is um, not having to worry about um, discovery. I think with this now we need to handle about peer discovery. So if a new peer comes in, you either need to let it know maybe the leader's um, IP address for it to connect to the leader somehow. Oh, yeah, I, I think there is a section in the paper that deals with that. Yeah, uh, so now you have to worry about discovery. But if you're yeah. using something like a like a central broker, you know, everybody just needs to know that broker. And yeah, but you know, the way it works too is all requests kind of send their leader. That's one thing I noticed. Like, the way it works is for the... Like, so I didn't get your network book. Oh, okay, I was saying another way, like, the way it kind of propagates leaders and, like, to know you like something is still is like all requests the same food the leader is currently right so you kind of and this is yeah. kind of like the next address or um whatever it is your transport implementation returns as the local address why that was it returns like some sort of address to find the person uh that's so an optimization I, for this implementation though yeah that's what i'm saying like i i, I think yeah. it was, but if you spin up a new node, you need to at least point it to some other node. You know that. No, was, yes. Okay. Well, yeah. True. True. But yeah, the paper handles that for when you change the uh, cluster configuration, you add new members or so you move members. The paper handle it, there's a section on that, but I've not read that section. Oh, so, no, I was trying to uh, like address because I mean the alternative, right? Oh, okay. Maybe I should do that. Like, okay. So, but if what what would be the ideal scenario, um, Anthony? Because I feel the alternative would be like you said, service discovery, some sort of service discovery where it can like they can discover like discover new services and all that stuff, right? Mm. Or what I don't know. Because I'm like, if you can at least find who the leader is within the cluster, you could I think the leader has a way of like getting when stepping down or when it's kind of podcast to his peers and to every other person. So, so I, I like, what, what do you think would be the ideal scenario? Yeah, I need to look up. I mean, I've not looked at some of these parts very deeply yet, but oh, okay. I'm curious about how, so usually all rights, like right operations go through the leader, right? Ideally. Yes, but everything leader, goes through the leader. Yeah, the leader keeps changing. So for a client, does that mean the client needs to have a way of, always knowing who the leader is or with the other nodes, any node the client connects oh, to, yeah. directs to the leader. Okay, yes. Um, if the 
if the leader goes offline and you try to contact the cluster and you send a message to a, a no, that's not the leader. It should by the people redirect it to the leader. Right? They have different ways of approaching this. For a small cluster, you can just retry another node until you find the leader. But uh, as an they specified as, as an optimization, you the uh, the node you contacted can redirect you that this is the person you should talk to, go talk to that leader. Yeah, but that okay, that means uh, but in a system where the leaders keep changing, I mean I I get it's a trade off that makes sense in this scenario. But it means yeah. that if if let's say you ping the wrong node and the wrong node returns the leader, you now need to ping the leader. So yes. Make maybe two, three calls. Yeah, but that doesn't happen often though, because by the um, according to the way the how the, the protocol works, the leader stays quite stable for a long time. Yeah. Usually, by the, when they did the in practical scenarios, when they observe the uh, rough system is running over time, the leader can stay stable for even months before there is a new uh, cluster yeah. reconfiguration. So that happens rarely, very rare. So does that mean maybe most clients, any client that's connecting to such a system would maybe make some requests to get the leader, the leader, the current leader, and then subsequent requests would go to that node? Yes, so in, in practice, the leaders don't change often. The lead, they, due to how the uh, protocol works, the leaders are quite stable. So yeah, it's, it's, it's not an optimization that you can... You may not even worry about that optimization because in practice, once you connect to a lead, uh, you can reliably contact that leader for a very long time. And yeah, but if, the, if it changes, because nodes and um, clients are usually not in the control of the, of the owners of the cluster, of the service provider. So you cannot yes. hope to go and change it in their clients, you know, when the leader changes. So I'm curious about how they well, implement this. Um, yeah. Okay, 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 yeah, yeah, there, there can be, there are different, um, no, I mean, the, gateway, different, the gateway just is like, cluster should have a service that, um, that allows you to, what's the word, to, to access all the nodes within that cluster, like some sort of, um, what's it, is it reverse container, or load balancer? Oh, yes, maybe so. Maybe no, it's it's like, a, like that SRV protocol that MongoDB uses. Now, if you use MongoDB in yeah. cluster yeah, configuration, like a replica yeah, yeah. set, yes. So the clients know all the nodes. And yeah, that's all the, maybe they know a few. Yes, they can know up to three. But I, I think what more nodes and those. Is that if, and it's actually true, the truth is, I mean, like within a cluster space, like server space, right? Or is it network space, right? There are limited number of addresses or like, addresses that particular nodes in the cluster can take. So yeah. if, worse, if worse comes to the worst, you pay everything. <laughs> oh, one way you can do it is put the service discovery outside. You know, this uh, wrapped thing and your replicated stage machine is yeah. just one part of your uh, the services that are in your uh, project. So it, it can be there, then there can be a, something like etcd, like a a config store that you can use for service discovery. So your clients will contact the uh, service discovery, um, let's say etcd, to get the address of wh whatever client they can yeah, talk to. That's what Kubernetes does. Yes, something like that. Yeah. So now your, your clients don't need to know all the machines that form part of the RAP cluster. They just need to know the address of, uh, of your service discovery mechanism. They go there and get an address even if it's not the um, leader, they just get an address there and they talk to that address. That address can redirect them to the leader. Or your yeah. service discovery mechanism can also give them the leader directly. Yeah, so I mean, that, that, that actually makes I think I think maybe the mistake I was making was, um, was um, discovery from the clients and discovery within the cluster. They are different things, so to speak. Right? I mean, like from the client, the client just wants to know the leader, but from the cluster, the cluster wants to know all the other players. So, 
So yeah, uh, I think I was. Yes, was, yes. That was, that was, yeah, I mean, the discovery guy could, I mean, once you know one leader or someone in the pen, you should know everyone. But the client side, you need to know the leader. So, so yeah, the discovery could actually make it easier. And I think, it, yeah, the protocol doesn't say anything really about like how you handle your discovery mechanism. Or, yeah, that's that's say an implementation thing if you want to customize Raft. Like this is the basics. Usually a Raft cluster is configured statically. So if, if a member is coming up, it knows the other addresses. The other, so, yeah, exactly. the so, but if you want to do make your configuration dynamic, that's now up to you. The to core me. protocol will still give you the guarantees of it. You just now you have to do your configuration yourself and be sure you get it right. And and it's true because I think I mean it doesn't it doesn't have to do with like scaling, right? It's more of consistency because scaling it doesn't really seem anything. The bottleneck still goes through the leader, so like it's not like yeah you're trying to yeah. Raph so doesn't scale. <laughs> So, which also brings me so yeah. I don't know which services actually use Raft, but I don't even miss your question. I, I mean, like this, this is I think we are. What you did you on on Raft actually? Yeah, no, as in sorry, this like which brings me to a question now. Is if let's assume you are building some services, would you prefer to like have some sort of like some services for consistency? Would you prefer to have like have each of them? run like a raft consensus protocol or would you just prefer or would as in, like with whole fsm like let's assume you are doing both now so you're using this raft to go like library you know, spin up your nodes would you prefer to do that yes, sorry, yeah, or would you prefer to just have... hello can you hear me now no i can't okay so i was saying would you prefer to like let's assume you are doing go so would you prefer to like have your service um, like spin up your different servers with the Rust consensus, then have your FSM like logic, um, like inside, like implemented in the Rust library, or would you just prefer using something like Kafka that ensures other like replicated logs and all that stuff, and you just have your service separately and just like plug them into each other? I think it's like an apples and oranges. Um, question like Kafka is different use cases. If you don't have any um, consistency guarantees, I mean, if you don't have any, if you don't need to be synchronous, I don't know how to put it, but the scenarios where you use Kafka would be for some kind of a synchronous communication. While Raft is more like no, you can you can technically use it for like um, keeping a consistent state with um, Kafka. Because I mean, the logs are kind of append only. Um, and no, no, no. Yes, I mean, uh, of course. And you can read like in sequence, so you can know like the, you can know like the current state you are in, and then continue reading the reading like the logs, and then updating your internal states. Well, I get what um, Anthony is saying. Yeah, no, the use cases, the use cases are different. See, Kafka is it gives you consistency, but it gives you eventual consistency not strong consistency so the use cases say you have an online store with, with an api that should be reachable and should be highly available so if one endpoint goes down you want to be sure that there are still other services like other servers uh, providing that same service you want to scale up and scale down easily right dynamically now you don't care if your users see the, the state of the system out of dates, as long as eventually they will see the same state at the end. Right? So it's eventually consistent. Yeah. Um, I think Raft is when you want everybody. Oh, yeah, 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 but but when you want everybody, yeah, that's why you can't scale Raft. Like everything must go through a single. Uh, yeah, leader. exactly. Okay. You don't want two persons to see different states of the state machine at the same time, right? So that's what Raps, Raps gives you very strong uh, uh, guys. Yeah, just, like Post, just like Postgres, Postgres Yeah, you know, but actually, actually, transactions. Yeah, that, that, I, that, that makes sense. Thanks for that explanation. Yeah, I think you, you can say you, I think Raps can be scalable. It's just that it won't be scalable for write. It will be scalable for read. And yeah, that's if you want, um, if you want, if you want to scale Raps for reads, then you're saying the 
uh, the second results, the followers can also be contacted for reads. Yes. Well, yes, that, that just takes that it don't... takes out the uh, guarantees of RAP. Yeah, yeah. Because you want them to see the rights, like uh, like atomic like, rights in a distributed like system. See, see this example here, or this one. They like they are not. This this guy doesn't mean that. For example, if the leader last sent a commit here, right? It means like if you start reading from all these ones, actually, yeah, you can because the truth is this: the followers don't um, commit their log changes until the leader says so, right? Exactly. So, which means if you are reading from all this, you will still be reading this, the last state the leader sent. Everyone should commit. So, like everything should still be fine, right? Or maybe yes, the kind of eventual consistency. But I, I, understand, I understand what it means because the leader would most likely always have like the latest state of everything. Yes. Yeah, but the leader I, might have committed something and then the, you are reading still data from the followers. That's why yeah, but, the, but there's no system you, that gives you that that guarantee. There's no distributed yeah. system that gives you that. Yeah, so you only get the guarantee if you are going through the leader. I think that's really yeah. I mean, yes. even if you use even if you use um where this this way, this way, master slave replication. The slaves are still likely to be a little bit behind the masters. Yeah, if, even MongoDB, it's that way. If you are reading from secondary, there they call it read preference. So if you set yes. read preference to be secondary, you will likely get stale data. But if you set read preference to uh, the primary, that's the master, you get the latest rights. And same yeah. with write preference. So that's what RAFT does. It makes you go through the primary. Yeah. I mean, for Raft, you can just send your rights to the primary and then read to all the other nodes. And I think it's possible to maybe program, make the, um, the service discovery like programmatic so you can add new nodes. To, like, you know how you scale up Kubernetes so you can easily just yeah. new nodes and taking down new nodes. I think yeah. that can still work. Yeah, you just, when, when you get to that point, you know that you probably should be using something else. Yeah, but there's really nothing. I mean, there are only a few players, Paxos and Raft. I mean, the other ones are not so popular. And so yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. When, when you're talking about the players in this space, you're talking about the players in consensus, right? So yes. uh, for consensus algorithms, if you, are, if you are going this way now, there are others too. It's not just Paxos and... Uh, yeah, no, I know, but the others are like... Um, I've oh, forgotten their names. Like this Byzantine one for blockchain, and then is this log something something that that Raft is based on? But they're still the ones that are still a bit popular are playing in different playing in different spaces. Yeah. But, for, so, but, but if you look at you are looking at their use case now, they are just focusing on total uh, strong consistency, right? So they are not even considering scalability. So it's for this unique part of your system that doesn't need to scale, like service discovery. You want to be sure that uh, you're adding new, uh, a new node to your cluster for a, a service now, um, like a new pod in a, in a node. Then you, you want to be certain that as that pod is put in, it's getting up-to-date configuration data. It's not trying to contact a database server that are, or a cache server that has already gone down. So. Yeah. In Kubernetes now, the service discovery for configuration has to be strongly consistent. But the other parts of uh, your, your application can be uh, eventually consistent. It, the, what Raft is solving is this part that must be strongly consistent. So once you get to the point where you need to scale reads, and if you are scaling reads, you know that you are going to eventual consistency, then, uh, or, or you want to make uh, all rights to boot the primary and the uh, and the secondary is strongly consistent. Well, I think you should just stop using Raft there. Because once you scale it, you get eventual consistency. And if you try to make the rights to all the clusters uh, strongly consistent, th there's only one, one, one way to do it. Either you go through Raft, like you go through the primary only as a Raft, or you try to do distributed transactions, like uh, some SQL databases allow you to do and with the yeah, that, that way is very messy. Like you have to do this. Uh, what they call it? Um, sharding, like with, with Cassandra. No, no, not sharding. Like, like two-phase commits. Oh, okay. 
yeah, mm -hmm. you have to start doing mm -hmm. two phase commits. And once you go to that, uh, that, get to that point, you've lost, you've just lost it. I, yeah, I mean, like, the truth is, there's no one solution to everything. Um, probably, yeah. So, if, 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 what, if what you are doing does not require strong consistency, then you can you can just skip crafts and use use something else that will perform very much better. So wait, something it, it wraps else. Itself doesn't scale. Something else like what? If you want to scale reads. Yeah, if you want to scale reads. Okay. Say um uh even MongoDB scales reads very well. But master slave, that's what they do. Yeah, they do master slaves and you yeah, can read I, from the secondary. You know, you can have many secondaries, as many secondaries as you want, and you can read from the secondaries. Right. You can what, get... Uh, um, what what Anthony, is saying, Anthony is saying, like, scaling reads, but, like, consistent reads, right? It's not just scaling reads. Yes. Yeah, you can't have yeah. consistent reads. I think reads. you can expose the... You can expose the slaves. And I think that is what... Um, what's the name of these people? Cockroach DB. That's what they do. I was checking their rafts implementation. They have a talk on it. And that's what they did. They use raft, but they just put, you know, you can go directly to the to the other nodes for it. And CocoGB is very scalable. I mean, that's their selling point. It's more scalable than Postgres and the rest. Yeah, and it's consistent. The reads, the reads from secondary. Well, that I, I, I mean, that's pretty much what CocoGB is known for. But I don't know how consistent. Coach TV. Let me check it out. Yeah, please. Uh, that, that, that would be some magic there. Because, you know, even when the followers in Raft wow. receive... Uh, strong, strongly consistent key value store. Let me... For Coach TV, Coach check. SQL database. Okay. Check the consistency. Oh, Is it for reads or for writes? I know now. Um... I mean, like they said, is a with strongly consistent key and oh, okay, yeah, sorry. So they have a distributed SQL database built on a transactional and strongly consistent key value store. It scales horizontally, survives this, supports strongly consistent RC transactions, and provides a familiar API for exactly. That's what I was saying, and it's I mean, it's open source, and they have a talk about it. It's also around yeah, strong. Even with uh, acid transactions, well, well let's. Okay. Yeah, I, I think it should be fun to actually. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll actually have to research this. Okay. Yeah, me because too, you know, in rafts, in rafts now, when you, when the uh, the, the um, followers apply the new states, new data to their states machine, they may not do it at the same time. There may be a time uh, lag between the time one fuller commits a new uh, piece of data and the time another fuller does the commit. Yeah, but the, the leader would most likely still have the update information. Yes, yes, yes that's what I'm saying, that you can't, you can't scale consistently. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I mean, okay, of now, course, I, okay, think, of, think of the time when you just add a new uh, node, you just add a new follower to your uh, raft and, and, and it has to now uh, say, uh, Synchronize it now has to get updates from the um, from the leader, right? During that point, if you contact the uh, if you contact that follower that is still replicating from the leader, you get still data. Yes. Well, they use rafts, and they have. There's a talk. I don't remember. I'll find it. Yeah, please find it. It would be nice to see that. Please find it. They use raft now, like this. I mean, like I don't actually. I don't know if tradition goes might be different, but like this literally says they are using exactly raft. Exactly. <laughs> yes, and they are using HashiCorp raft, the one we just studied. Yeah, it should be interesting. Uh, either HashiCorp raft or ETCD raft, one of them. Yeah, like I said, the presentations are different. So anyone. I was even looking into Rust Raft implementation and built in Rust <laughs> 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 uh, I really need to learn proper Rust. Like it's easy to go through 
uh, open source projects in Go compared to in a lot of languages. <laughs> because the other yeah. languages will make you confused first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but when you when you get the concepts, you appreciate them more than Go because yes. I, I think Go can drive you crazy. Yes, yeah, yeah. error handling and the yeah, Go is just abstractions. Nothing exists, but I it mean, also I mean, makes it, means that you don't need to know a lot of deep concepts before you can look at someone else's code. Yeah, I mean, like at, yeah. I'm, I'm at my current place of work, we 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 should I say we say. I mean, only two of us have like Go experience, yeah. right? But well, we are recently, I mean, we're working on a Go project as in that requires Go. I mean, eventually, well, so, you know, I, I work in like this crypto distributed space. Yeah, space just meta or something. So eventually you either, you, I mean, most of the projects are Go, 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 Go. So, I mean, we have to work with a bunch of stuff. And, and like, picking it up. Yeah, Go, is an, Go is an economic steam. It's just, it's able to onboard developers cheaply. Yeah, I mean, like, it was, when, it was, when you want more power out true. of your language, you get frustrated. So I was <laughs> imagining if if you are using something like Rust or one of all these, like, I mean, there's going to be a lot of things that you need to explain, like. <laughs> exactly. So you you yeah, writing yeah. the code, like, you feel like you are using a toy, but the toy means that everybody understands what you've written in the end. Yeah. yeah. That's what well, no, it means that they can step through it, but th there's a point where, like, if I'm reading, say, Ross code now, like, a lot of information is packed in a few lines, right? Yes. Or yes. some other language. And then it, it takes some time to unpack everything. But once you're used to it, now you can get, you can read through something and get a lot of information in a very short time if you're using those languages. If it's, if it's good, you're, strong, you're slogging into a lot of text, like, it's explained in, like a, the dumbest fashion, so you can easily get bored <laughs> and you get frustrated. It's okay, not, people, have, not, people have their references, they have their preferences. Yeah. So I think it's really true. I didn't want us to pass this to our mark, but yeah. But it was a, it was an interesting discussion, really. Um. Yeah, I think I recorded this. Yes, I hope it comes out well. So, <laughs> so about this, anyone that wants to go into can kind of understand like. Where do you want to check? Where do you want to implement this guy? As mm -hmm. for me, at least I got to know more about Raft. I've only been hearing. I've only been hearing about um like about it or like a uh, Raft, 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 like Z Life Raft or something. But <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, like it, it makes sense. I yeah, the first time I, I heard of Raft, it was made like. Sounded very complicated. I don't know. Yes, I, I think it was it was a vlog like uh, someone was talking about reading the raft paper. It made it sound very complicated. Like now, I do not. I can think more about raft or think more about consensus like, generally, and probably our how like it applies to raft too. Because like I, as it helps like expand the mind, and you actually realize that most of these things are not so complicated. Yeah, yeah. The first time I saw Raft was like three years ago, four years ago, Seth. In this um, ETCG Raft. You know, when they when they, anybody launches a cool package, they'll put it on this Go Weekly. And I was like, oh, nice. Let me look at it. <laughs> and you don't understand shit. <laughs> and their description. Eventually, then, eventually I've, learned, I've learned to uh, consult the actual, say, RFCs or the research yeah. papers. Yeah, they are usually very readable. Some of them, not all, but so see, so it kind of depends on your background. Me personally, I only started doing this when I started doing Haskell because in Haskell Reddit, everybody's sharing papers. <laughs> Any question you ask, you ask, they'll show you a paper. But yeah. it's, it depends on your background. So, people who started in those kind of ecosystems, Okamo, Haskell, you know, they're used to reading papers for everything. Yeah, but then also well, I just I just picked up the habits newly, but it's I found that it's very it made a lot of things easier. Even before I wasn't reading uh, papers, but when I I think I picked up this habit when I started learning TypeScript, mm. uh, or, or when I was in my final year project and I had to look through some things, and I, 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 well, that was about the same period. So now learning the TypeScript, the, the handbook was very nice. Then 
it, it was good. Of course, they have good documentation there. Then I, I got, although the actual reference, the language reference, they've abandoned it. It's not really updated Absolutely. anymore. But, but it was very helpful. It's, it's made me understand a lot of things. Right. Yes, yeah, so that also brings the approach. Like, I mean, because I mean, the idea behind this whole talk is to really know like what is there as like different ways to approach, right? Especially so in cases like this where there are like proper documentation, right? It's kind of, I mean, I think it's it's really a good idea to always try and go through that first before diving in. You want to understand the myths, the myth of how to work, right? But in cases where I mean, you are working, like you are working on a code base that doesn't have like good documentation, as no reference, um, like paper or implementation or something somewhere. Like, what do you do? So, I, although the truth is, I think most projects like that, that are open source, don't usually go far, right? So, yeah, yeah. We don't find much of that out in the world, but, but still, like it is, I mean, it's it's one of the things we are learning, like different approaches, and it's always good to try and start from the documentation and go through and check what so you can understand. Like me now, like if there's no paper, I just pray they have like some tests that someone can walk through you know, to to know how to navigate or look for the main font. Look for the main font, like Anthony was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's habit, it's habit. So you, want, I like to just walk through entry points. It's habit, but uh, so I know that you know going through tests is always good. But when you are used to working in projects that have terrible tests, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but you can just skip the test. You just try to run it and see the what's the entry points, and you start yeah, from there. Well, so the thing about this really, actually, there are a lot of learning points from this too, because this we are we are first having sort of like some sort of binary, right, or what? <laughs> but because yes. for now, we actually are like in library, so to speak. Yeah, like you can find if it, if it's a library, if something like a library, you can find another project that's using that library and see their entry points. Exactly. Yeah, true, but. In our case, like this, so in our case here, like this guy actually doesn't, like all he just does is references the raft logs, but he doesn't even, so like we are very unlucky. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's where, I, I think this is this uh, principle of dependency inversion, like don't call me, I'll call you or something. So yeah, he just exactly. provides, satisfies the interface and then they will call him. <laughs> is, that can be frustrating too. <laughs> so, I mean, a lot of things were like, like we're not so straightforward, really. But yeah, it was good. We found our way through it. So hopefully, the next thing we'll be working on might be more straightforward. <laughs> Something like, I don't know, maybe Kubernetes doesn't sound like a library or like Docker. So those ones, they should have been made somewhere. Or most yeah, actually, actually, we usually pick what to work on or what do we, we usually sort, um, re uh, recommend? What yeah, recommend. recommend. So what do you think? Yeah. Yeah, so I think at this point, like, we went a bunch of stuff around distributed systems and storage. Um, I don't know, like, um, should we, like, move into another storage, like, SQLite, or probably just jump into some of our I don't know. Me, personally, I want to, I mean, Mexico is a public holiday. I want to, uh, like, we implement so this like the simplest distributed database possible <laughs> oh you want like, to yeah. okay so exactly i wanted to bring up a suggestion or actually maybe it was personal so i was i was i don't know um is there a way we can like improve engagement um because i i can i i believe some people might have been finding it hard like going through this so my plan was like during the week when i have time but most of the time it's usually late in the evening i get to like have time to go through like anything that's study. so i don't think it's the right time to tell everyone hey i'm streaming this so is there is there another way maybe we can like increase engagement while studying because you know this is a different dynamic i think at this point i can stop recording right so or should i continue recording okay you can even turn off video so it saves our data and the yeah, are still in Nigeria. <laughs>